All right. I hope everybody can hear me okay. It's 8 o'clock here in the uh, West Coast. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Soyola Basang, and I'm the Managing Director of Daspedia. Thank you for joining another edition of webinar hosted by Daspedia. We are a training firm focused on in-building wireless technology. Daspedia hosts regional seminars, training courses, online webinars, and we also provide networking opportunities among our industry peers. Our today's speaker is Lance Kraft. He's here to give us some perspective into future of wireless technology by presenting a webinar titled Evolution of Wireless Networks. Lance Kraft is a good friend of Daspedia and he currently serves as a VP of Sales Americas at Daly Wireless. Prior to Daly Wireless, Lance was a VP of Sales at PowerWave Technologies and worked for other well-known wireless companies such as ADC, American Tower, and Verizon Wireless. Let's all give warm welcome to Lance and I'll transfer the control over to him now. Please submit your questions during his webinar using chat box shown in your right hand corner in your control panel. We'll, we'll go over them at the end of Lance's presentation. There you go, Lance. Thank you, Soyola. Uh, we truly appreciate the opportunity of speaking uh, on the webinar here presented by Daspedia. Uh, we welcome all of the attendees on behalf of our employees and shareholders and myself. Uh, we're very grateful you could take the time to be a part of this uh, web broadcast this morning. In the presentation, what we're going to discuss the evolution of wireless networks, how we believe, how we see the industry evolving uh, as it is today and as we see the future um, evolution of the wireless networks. Dally Wireless, as you can tell on slide two, Dally Wireless has been recognized by many top uh, technology research firms uh, as a technology disruptor. Uh, we've uh, received many technical awards, as you can see along the bottom, and have been uh, noted as the number one innovation in building wireless by uh, ABI Research. We are a U.S.-based company out of Menlo Park, uh, California. We have research and development uh, center is located in Vancouver, Canada, with global sales and customer service operations throughout the world. Uh, North America, uh, Latin America, Mexico, Europe, and the Asia-Pacific markets, we have representation uh, throughout the globe. We've developed an all-digital uh, DAS, or what we like to refer to as an all-digital RF distribution system. Uh, it supports uh, commercial and public safety bands. This uh, RF distribution system is a patented uh, 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 solution. We've got over 260 patents globally and uh, still counting. When we look at the different uh, installations that we have and the, the verticals that we have installed in, there's various markets, uh, including verticals such as airport, transportation, enterprise, uh, public safety solutions, as well as hospitals, hotels, and many other venues uh, around the globe. So let's get into the evolution of the radio access network as we uh, see the, evolve, uh, the evolvement of the networks today. Slide four. This is an example of the current RAN architecture. The top uh, illustration is a typical um, uh, RF interface with a base station uh, into the head end. And then as we receive the RF into our head end, we take that RF input, digitize uh, the information, and transport it via a digital SIPRI stream or a digital packet uh, across a digital data stream out to the remotes. This is the typical architecture that we're seeing today. Uh, many of the installations that you may have worked on or you have uh, experienced, uh, this is a typical 
uh, installation. The base station itself can be either a high power or even a low power input into the head end. The illustration, uh, the, the, the bottom illustration shows the digital interface with the baseband unit. As uh, many of the systems start to uh, evolve into smaller footprints or using the BBU, uh, we can actually take the CIPRI uh, 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 transport or the CIPRI uh, stream into our head end and transport that out to our remotes as well. In both of the illustrations, you can see that the, the remotes have the capability of supporting IP-based applications such as Wi-Fi and security cameras. As the next slide, as the uh, industry migrates to a centralized RAN, and we're hearing a lot about the CRAN today in our conversations, the resources uh, basically are becoming centrally. Uh, located in what they call a centralized RAN configuration. Uh, this could be uh, based on the, the assessment to to have better control um, of the of the solutions that are out there today by removing the base stations and centralizing the base stations back at the central location uh, and or adding the BBUs uh, in a central configuration. Again, our heading equipment is just removed. In this illustration, it's, it's removed and centralized to accommodate multiple locations simultaneously from a centralized location. Um, the distribution to various remote locations, this enables resource pooling and spectrum efficiency. So as you can see, as we send the same, uh, we receive the same RF or we receive the same digital uh, information into the head end. It is transported via digital data stream out to the remotes and again it can uh, deliver this content uh, to each of the uh, each of the locations or new locations. This could be indoor, it could be outdoor um, uh, so long as uh, the the reach of the fiber distance is considered in your in your fiber uh, design. The next slide. As the industry further migrates to a RAM virtualized, uh, virtualized network, the routing configuration and the control management of network elements are virtualized. This way, configuration and management of the network can be done remotely and on demand. So as you can see, um, virtualizing the RAN into a regional data center DALI has the capability in our head end with our new matrix of accepting, uh, currently accepting CIPRI as the, uh, as the input into our digital switch. It doesn't have to be. One of the things to note is uh, it does not have to be CIPRI. It can be ORI. It could be any other packet data stream um, that, that the BBU would deliver to us. This really, the, the, the switch at the regional data center uh, really operates as a cross-connect digital switch. The key to this is that everything is done virtually. It's also done from a software-defined uh, uh, application, and we'll talk about that in the next slide. But uh, So it comes into our digital switch, and we send it out again uh, to the remotes. Uh, one thing to note on this illustration is the remotes have now uh, become software-defined radios um, to where the information that is sent is, uh, is software configurable. Next slide. Software-defined networking is an architecture that separates the network control and data forwarding functions. Here's a typical software-defined uh, architecture. Uh, this is a wireless application Again, virtualizing the, uh, the, the BBUs into a wireless application. We're sending that information into the control. Again, the control is the DALI uh, digital cross-connect switch, or uh, currently what we call our HDBBI 16. But it goes into the control switch. We send that information. We send that uh, content um, out to the remote, which then delivers 
the wireless signals to the end users. Uh, it, as you will see in, in our conversations as we proceed forward, this isn't just a mobile. This could be uh, monitoring Internet of Things. And as we progress we into the conversation, we'll talk about uh, how this supports and uh, what 5G means to this, this configuration. So separating a control plane and data plane, uh, this simplifies the network management, allowing rapid configuration of networks. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, the rapid configuration of network uh, requirements for uh, LTE and, and FirstNet in, in their conversation moving forward. And then also the dynamic load balancing, the ability to uh, efficiently manage the spectrum and dynamically uh, balance uh, uh, the, the, the demands of the users uh, through a software configurable uh, balancing remotely. So what does this mean to you? Um, reflecting on the evolution of the RAN architecture, today it's a base station fed RF. Uh, we're going to be seeing a, a migration of base station or BBU pooling back to a CRAN architecture and then moving to a true a virtualized or true software data center that will be delivering what we believe will be delivering content out to the devices or or out to the end user. Uh, again, today it's RF uh, into and, or CIPRI into um, the head end and a digital data stream delivering um, out to the software uh, uh, defined radios uh, delivering the content uh, to the end users. That's where we see the migration over the course of the next uh, uh, 10 to 12 years. Um, we're going to see a migration from coax cable to straight uh, fiber, whether uh, we, we believe dark fiber obviously it gives you the most density in your fiber plant, but this is to accommodate the increase in the data speeds moving forward. Uh, moving forward. Speed is the key uh, as we move forward in the evolution of the RAN architecture. The radio units, as we mentioned, uh, today, our radios are software configurable. They'll become true uh, software-defined radios, intelligence at the edge, very frequency agile and capable of, uh, uh, of software configurability remotely. Uh, we will see the evolution of that in, uh, uh, in, in the coming uh, years. Again, DALI, today we have a software configurable remote, and we can adapt accordingly. Uh, as the as the, as the systems uh, change, so what are the benefits as the evolution of the RAN architecture we just described moves from RF to digital CIPRI and to central and then a virtualized RAN? It enables more efficient utilization of spectrum resources. Obviously, if we, uh, carriers come by way of more spectrum, obviously that increases the capabilities. But what we're talking about here is efficiently utilizing the current spectrum resources and enabling more efficiency across the spectrum. It's a simplified network management, a rapid reconfiguration of the network, and as we mentioned, it enables dynamic load balancing across the entire uh, uh, solution, across the entire network. So what is uh, 5G? A lot of conversations around 5G. Uh, it's the next generation of, uh, of technology. It's got a long way to go before it's a reality. Uh, there are obviously tests and plans underway. We're seeing a lot of uh, uh, press about different carriers uh, doing uh, certain tests and planning uh, for 5G. There's no publicly uh, uh, agreed upon standard for 5G. I think that's something that we want to make sure is noted. And mainly, um, the difference between the 5G compared to the 4G uh, will be speed. Uh, it's low latency and high capacity is what the solution intends to deliver and and uh, speed is definitely the key uh, to, to 5G. Current mobile standards 3G and 4G lack the bandwidth. I expect 5G to adjust uh, this either through higher frequency bands, new spectrum, or through smarter use of existing spectrum as, as we've mentioned. 5G uh, may be a consolidation of 2G, 3G, 
4G and Wi-Fi. You're seeing a lot of conversations around LAA, uh, LWA, the aggregation of all of these, uh, all these uh, uh, capabilities into a single licensed, unlicensed uh, uh, usage format. 5G may be used for Internet of Things, smart meters, connected cars, etc. But whatever 5G uh, agreed upon, it, uh, it is very likely that 5G will be deployed in a virtualized RAN network. Uh, we truly believe that operating on a web scaled uh, on web scaled uh, data centers. So this is certainly becoming a non-proprietary software-driven architecture uh, with the intelligence uh, at the edge. We'll also see, and we'll talk about this in the next slide, microwave links to, uh, for uh, access points. Again, what does this mean to you? Um, as we migrate to 5G, uh, networks uh, must be carefully designed to accommodate the increase in data rate. Uh, mobile operators are able to push more Internet of Things and other applications to the network. The consolidation of Wi-Fi and cellular will make better usage of available spectrum. We're seeing that uh, today in uh, licensed and unlicensed bands uh, in, in the request from carriers uh, to be operable in our remotes. F 5G will be much more latency tolerant. This enables centralized web scale data centers which can go a much greater distance throughout the country on higher speed fiber networks. This is really a key that we'll point out here as we as we move forward. And then again, uh, consolidation. Uh, we mentioned Wi-Fi cellular and the usage of millimeter wave uh, will drive frequency agile remotes. Uh, software, defined radios, frequency agile, um, consolidated um, services and, and spectrum efficiency. These are all keys uh, to keep in mind as we move uh, to, uh, to 5G. So let's talk about uh, LTE. Uh, obviously, uh, everything that we hear in commercial is LTE, and everything that we hear in public safety is becoming uh, LTE with the initiatives around FirstNet. Uh, things are certainly changing uh, with all of the ordinances that are being passed uh, for inbuilding public safety, first responder requirements, especially in new buildings. Uh, things are changing uh, rapidly. Um, in order to get occupancy uh, certificates, uh, you have to have, uh, at a minimum in most uh, cities we're seeing, at least fire uh, as far as the, the service available. New buildings designed uh, are now uh, obviously to minimize energy consumption. They're putting tinted windows, uh, insulation, uh, other things that attenuate the inbuilding wireless signal from penetrating from outdoor. Uh, and, and this is obviously increasing a need to consider public safety uh, in buildings. I should include DAS. Uh, one thing that we think we sh you should uh, consider is when you're looking at uh, adding, uh, for those of you who are, are doing designs for, for adding additional um, facilities on or building new facilities is uh, we've seen a um, a lot of uh, a lot of success working with design companies uh, that you know to design the base on the floor and and to design the DAS up front. It it saves uh, obviously saves. Let's also consider redundancy. I think this is a, a big key that we're talking about now. Is in the event that there is a uh, an emergency situation, what is the survivability and redundancy of the solution that you put into these buildings, providing this public safety solution? Um, and Dali, uh, we're taking a lot of consideration into these two things as we do these designs. We also, um, when you think about public safety, uh, the systems that we put in, all local agency, multi-band, and multi-technology is required. Uh, you've got to think about uh, all of the local agencies that are, that are needed uh, to potentially be on the system. NFPA, um, it is absolutely in 90% of the uh, requirements that we see for public safety uh, is required and, and is a is a certification required for the equipment that you're putting in. Uh, NFPA uh, 1221 standard for installation, maintenance, and use of emergency services uh, communication systems. 
uh, 2006. They started to move away from, uh, moved out of uh, NFP 72 into NFP 1221. And the big question is, is NFPEA uh, keeping up uh, with the requirements and technology that are being implemented today? Um, uh, but it is something to consider when you're looking at a public safety solution that it is uh, NFPA uh, uh, compliant. And then the much anticipated uh, decisions around FirstNet establishing to build and operate and maintain a high-speed single interoperable wireless network dedicated for public safety for all states and territories within the United States. This might be one of the uh, uh, last greenfield deployments or first greenfield deployments that we have seen in a very long time. Um, we, we believe this could actually be done uh, uh, by a virtual network uh, deployment in the U.S. Um, we're currently working with some of the virtualized uh, companies on a solution for uh, band 14, but obviously the flexibility and the adaptability for the individual states and the agency is a must. Um, and in order for FirstNet to be uh, successful, it's also going to need to be cost prohibitive for these uh, states and agencies to, to join. Next slide. Uh, we're on slide uh, 15. So narrowband uh, currently uh, LTE. When we look at uh, P25, uh, moving from narrowband to broadband. Um, narrowband LTE is used for public safety communication today. As the industry migrates to broadband LTE, it will offer many other advanced features including, for example, real-time incident monitoring, health monitoring, and many other real-time incident solutions through a video transmission. This is going to happen. Uh, we believe it's uh, um, what we have heard and all of you have heard is, is November is a target date for the announcement or award of how FirstNet will proceed with their RFP. It's also going, uh, but, but it's what we believe is the people who use the system uh, we'll need to decide how LTE will be used and how the public uh, safety agencies will um, uh, cooperate. And again, this has got to be something that is very cost effective uh, for the agencies to move away from their current platforms. Next slide. Again, as it relates to FirstNet and public safety, what does this mean to you? Uh, what does it mean to them? Uh, some municipalities are, are already, again, we mentioned mandating public safety for new buildings to obtain occupancy permit. Um, we also mentioned uh, the adoption is, uh, is going to have to be cost uh, effective or the adoption rate is going to be very slow. Um, again, in some municipalities uh, where it is not mandatory, uh, we believe it's still a good idea to anticipate the requirements of uh, LTE FirstNet uh, solutions uh, and public safety coverage for the different agencies. It's logical. Uh, we're working with a lot of companies, uh, structured cable uh, companies. Uh, you may be on here. I know Daspedia has a, a, um, a, a, show, a seminar or show in uh, New York coming up. Uh, relative to structured cable companies and structured cable. We have had a lot of success working with uh, the low volt companies across the United States in anticipating uh, uh, not only a commercial but also public safety but taking it into a phased approach where the cabling is considered a scope of work as well as the DAS design and solution up front as these buildings are designed or considerations are made. Next slide. Uh, how to migrate to future networks seamlessly. We talked about how today everything uh, that we see in building is in a distributed or a DAS type of architecture. I think, uh, you know, it was mentioned, uh, whether believable or not, that the DAS is, is, is uh, migrating to a different uh, platform. I believe it's, uh, it's not really going to be called DAS, but it's certainly a a digital RF distribution solution. 
it's definitely going to become centralized as far as RAN as a first step. As the service providers and the carriers look at densification efforts uh, in an outdoor environment, you're certainly going to see the efforts around centralized uh, RAN architectures. As they get control of the current RF base stations and BBUs that are out there in the network and they centralize these uh, these hardware platforms, you'll see um, what we mentioned, you'll see a migration to true RAN virtualization where it will become software driven into what we believe a cross-connect digital uh, platform or digital switch to deliver the content uh, of 2G, 3G, 4G, and 5G as well as the Wi-Fi and unlicensed spectrums across the network. Um, for public safety, it's obviously it's a seamless migration of P25 Tetra uh, to a, a uh, uh, US or through to a LTE FirstNet uh, solution that's available to the agencies. So what is the future? Uh, slide uh, 18. Uh, obviously, we believe the future, and that's why our platform was developed around the techniques and uh, an all digital and software reconfigurable platform that is technology agnostic. It's very key, and frequency agile is very key, uh, and enables operators and enterprise to maximize the usage of their existing capital investment while providing them with a seamless migration path to the future generation of wireless networks. I think as if you're considering uh, going or considering installing a DAS, you really need to consider the benefits of what the technology of digital offers. Uh, DALI certainly has, a, again, an award-winning innovative uh, digital solution um, and uh, certainly meets the requirements of, of uh, of the migration and evolution of centralized LAN, RAN and virtualized RAN. Your investment uh, with other solutions uh, may not uh, migrate to this uh, evolution of where the digital revolution or, or evolution is taking us in the wireless space today. Next slide. So let's recap. Uh, again, DALI, um, we offer uh, today, we support the current RAN architecture with an RF input. We can take high power or low power into our head end. Uh, we can, as the industry migrates to a direct digital interface, the baseband units can interface directly again into our uh, head end. We do this in a, in a, as everybody probably has the question is, how do we do this, right? Uh, we, we, we do it a little differently. We have an application uh, interface, uh, uh, software uh, interface uh, solution that we don't need to have the proprietary information or SIPRI information uh, from uh, the OEM, whether it be uh, uh, Ericsson, Samsung, uh, uh, Nokia, uh, and we interface, we provide this software interface and it's really agnostic to us. Uh, an all digital and modular system allows the RF modules to be easily replaced with baseband interface modules. So as you migrate the systems away from RF and into a digital input, our SIPRI switch, our cross connect switch, our, again, I want to make a note, this does not need to be SIPRI. It probably will not be SIPRI as the evolution of the networks progress. Um, it doesn't matter to us. So we can adapt accordingly. And uh, the investment that you make uh, for the RF inputs today, we can insert into our head end. The, and I think the illustration shows that you can put the digital interface directly into our head end and then out to uh, our software-defined radios that's part of the matrix solution. Again, this is a digital data stream from the regional data center, um, as we discussed, and uh, the current the uh, um, architecture uh, can migrate uh, to RAN virtualization as, as we've described. Um, with that, uh, Wendy, I'll pass it back to you. Again, we appreciate uh, everybody's time. Um, again, it, it, we will field any questions that may have come in. Uh, Wendy, I'll pass the mic back to you at this time. Thank you, Lance. 
Um, that was very informative. So we received uh, a couple questions. Um, I want to introduce Gary Spedalier on the phone as well. He's um, joining us as a panelist for the Q&A. Um, so first off, uh, one question that we have is uh, which vendors Cipri supported uh, is supported by your products? So Wendy, can you still hear me? This is uh, Lance. Yes, yes I, can, I can hear you. Okay, so let me uh, let me answer that question, and and Gary can support it uh, accordingly. Um, as I mentioned, um, we support any OEM uh, Cipri Digital interface into our HD BBI, uh, what we call HD BBI 16, a uh, Cipri Digital switch. And what I mean by any is we we don't need to understand the Cipri um, a proprietary information of each of the OEMs. We literally provide them with a software development or an open API application interface that allows them to deliver their information into our switch and then we uh, basically act as the SIPRI transport out to the remotes that are in the buildings or on the poles or otherwise. So we, we, we do not, um, there's, there is some integration efforts but, but not on a scale that requires them to provide us uh, proprietary information. But Gary, anything to add? I don't know that Gary can be heard. Okay, Lance, yeah, just quickly by going down the route of an API, an application program interface, we define the interface requirements into our equipment. And that allows any OEM to basically develop a translation program that it, not only with the payload but also with the uh, O&M software embedded in their SIPRI signal to interface to our equipment without giving away any proprietary information. And the key to that is to protect the proprietary information. For those of you that have worked with the major OEMs, you know that that's a, a long, hard road. We are continuing down that road, but the thing we've seen more importantly, particularly relevant to the topic of this discussion, is the fact that we are currently working with uh, several uh, virtual RAND companies, uh, startups that are looking at us to work with what they have in the digital domain to essentially implement what we've talked about in this presentation. And if things are on schedule, we should be able to demonstrate that by the end of the year. Again, we can't talk about those companies, all those relationships are un under NDA, but those are the things we're working with. So efforts on trying to get within the major OEMs, the traditional you know, big base station vendors, and at the same time work with much more forward-looking companies that are developing virtual RAN. Okay, Wendy? Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Lance. Um, second question. What is the spectrum range that uh, DALI supports? As it relates to the commercial currently uh, bands is 700, uh, 800, 850, uh, 1900, 2100, 2300, and 2.5 or 2.6. Um, we currently have released uh, all of those bands in the modular format in our matrix uh, except for the 2.5 or 2.6 and um, it, as well as in our remotes. As it relates to public safety, we support 150, uh, 450, uh, 700 uh, LTE narrowband and broadband P25, uh, phase one, phase two we support as well as uh, 800. And I believe, Gary, 900 as well. Maybe you can correct me. No, that, that's correct. In, in the matrix platform, because of what we do, we're putting 320 megahertz of mixed spectrum down the fiber pipe as a digital packet signal. The remotes themselves, the RF portion, the analog portion, the thing that connects to the antenna, those are all modules. And we can develop those further as more bands are put into play. The other thing that we mentioned within this presentation, that as we migrate forward, 
what we're going to see is much denser deployment of the radio nodes. Those denser deployments are probably going to use lower power radios, and those lower power radios will be, be software defined radios. So as that technology evolves, we'll probably be ever able to cover something between 450 and 3 gigahertz in a single radio by selecting it and configuring it with software. And that's what we're doing as we evolve this network to literally make the radio itself as flexible as the rest of the digital network. And though we can't virtualize the radio, we can certainly make it flexible enough that you can configure it as a band-specific virtual radio remotely using software. So that's where we're evolving it to. Okay, thank you, Gary. Thank you, Lance. Uh, next question. When will the DALI wireless software defined re remote unit be available? That's a good question. Uh, <laughs> and I'm not trying to avoid it. Um, it is currently on our roadmap for 2017. So the technology is there. It's a matter of integrating the product, deciding how many radios we need because of the, you know, SISO, MIMO, 4x4 MIMO questions that are coming up. And then being able to integrate that with a flexible Wi-Fi module as well. And we're working with a couple of companies in terms of enterprise quality Wi-Fi to match the capabilities of the Wi-Fi network to the capabilities of the licensed spectrum network. Okay, thank you, Gary. Um, next question. Does your radio support future higher bands, uh, for example, 30 gigahertz for 5G? Is that on your wall map? Okay, again, that's a really good question. Yes, it, it's something we're looking at, but the honest answer to that, from our opinion, if we look at how we're doing this, right now they're talking about using everything from about 6 gigs up to 70 gigs, millimeter wave, for access points. And it is our opinion is that those frequencies are much too high to be used for access points. Your footprint would be so small that it, it, it wouldn't be worthwhile or your power output would be so high is that you could use it as a microwave, quite literally. So I think what we're trying to do is look at how the 5G standard is evolving, and as Lance mentioned, it's still evolving. And what we're trying to do is see where those higher frequencies will fit in. Now, one of the things that we can do today if you look at those higher frequencies as backhaul or front haul, we can integrate our SIPRI digital data stream into millimeter wave radios. Again, we're working with a couple of companies that are doing some advanced work on this. And what we're working on in conjunction with them is targeting a 10 gigabit data stream over millimeter wave radio at somewhere around 70 gigs. So that's unlicensed backhaul. That capability is probably limited to a mile, a mile and a half, but we can cascade those if needed. So what that, what that does is it gives us a lot of flexibility with the last mile connection to the radio that's connected to the antenna by using millimeter wave. And we can go down in frequency and use those for other applications as we need to. It's still a question in our minds as to how those frequencies, which are basically MMDS and LMDS frequencies re repurposed, there's still a question as to how they will actually be used within the evolving 5G spec. If they are used for access points, we will be able to develop radios and integrate those into our remotes. Thank you, Gary. Uh, next regarding uh, public safety. Do you anticipate that the public safety network will migrate to a CRAN architecture? And if so, what is their timing for doing so? Okay, again, 
great questions, guys. I absolutely believe that this will happen. And I believe it will happen because I think public safety will eventually migrate to LTE. And this is outside of FirstNet. Whether FirstNet succeeds or not, we believe that you're going to see LTE widely deployed for public safety. One of the things we see is that public safety agencies are by their very nature conservative. And since all of us are at some time going to depend on them, I'm glad they are conservative. But as they evolve, what they're going to have, and FirstNet is the prime example, and Lance mentioned this, I believe that FirstNet may be the first virtual RAN configuration used. And in that case, there's a lot of advantages because the security requirements on the individual radios connected to the antennas become a lot less critical, and you can focus on the security requirements of a web scale data center, or three, or four, or however many web scale data centers you need to give you the backup and the redundancy for a national public safety network. So that's a very forward-looking statement, but that's the way we think it will evolve. And the only thing that could slow down, I won't say stop, but it could be slowed down depending on as FirstNet evolves the bids and I it, it, it evaluates the bids. We haven't been, been you know, part of the evaluation process, but as they evaluate the bids, the traditional companies that play in public safety will be offering, I suspect, a compatible system that does B25 and LTE simultaneously. And that means that that network is probably going to remain as a very traditional network. I think if you have a LTE only system, it's going to be virtual. Long hey, winded answer, you. Wendy, but good question. <laughs> but it was uh, really good. Um, next question is regarding the RF input. What is the maximum RF input power into the DAS system? Is there a need to have an attenuator tray? Okay, the, the tray that Lance showed, that little central device, um, we call uh, a universal base station interface tray and what it is it has a number of modules and it, its current configuration today we have RF conditioning modules that you can plug in there and those modules the high power version has a single uh, input up to 100 watts the lower power version has dual inputs 5 watts each and that's obviously focused on small cell applications. And the interesting thing that Lance mentioned is that as you migrate from a traditional DAS to a SIPRI fed to something fed by a new packet data stream in the future, those RF conditioning modules can be removed and digital modules plugged into the chassis. Thank you, Gary. Uh, next question is related to small cell. Where do you see the role for DAS in the elder space versus uh, small cell deployments? I think that this whole issue about small cells in DAS, you know, uh, the DAS side of the business will tell you that we need to have a multiple operator, neutral host type system that you can install anywhere. The small cell uh, team will tell you they're developing small cells that do multiple technologies, multiple operators. And in fact, I think there's going to be a convergence of those. We are seeing right now major applications where radios can be fed from small cells, radio networks, into the SIPRI switch that Lance talked about and then redirected to the coverage area that they need. The small cell is by definition a low power base station. Unfortunately, the way it was pushed into the market was is also low capacity. And if you look at densification efforts, those two things are not compatible. 
So what we see is continuing development of small cells that will be used to feed DAS systems. They will be full capacity LTE systems with all the advantages of LTE. And the DAS system will provide the RF power at the right point you need it. So we see that they are compatible in both senses. We don't see them as independent of each other. We're careful not to mix up femtocells with small cells. Femtocell is a very different animal. It's not part of the RAN. It's deployed as an overlay on top of the RAN network. And we believe that that will remain a uh, low cost, uh, small office, home office type product, giving you adequate performance. But it's, it's, it's a niche market. And then eventually, what we're seeing is all of these things are starting to disappear as we evolve into an all digital network where we can push SIPRI signals, IQ signals, or content itself right out to the edge where we have intelligent radios. And those radios are connected to the antenna to provide the wireless service. And when that happens, the key is that the difference between a DAS remote and a small cell radio starts to disappear. They start to look very, very similar. Okay, thank you, Gary. Uh, next question is regarding uh, cellular and Wi-Fi. Uh, the presentation had a focus on providing cellular and Wi-Fi on the same digital backbone for inbuilt solutions. Another vendor is doing this with parallel cabling in the same pole with um, that platform. How is a DALI system going to be different? Okay, first of all, what we do is um, with the matrix platform, we can actually put up to four gigabit Ethernet streams over the same fiber that is carrying our 320 megahertz of mixed RF spectrum. Those gigabit Ethernet ports could be used for uh, LAA, in which case what we're doing is we're aggregating literally four carriers from 802.11.ac with one carrier from LTE to deliver a throughput of 100 megabits per second. And that can be done now. So when we do that, what we're integrating is the Wi-Fi packet data into our packet data stream. And the best way, the best example I can think of of this, if you look at it, packet data is like a train. Okay? Every, every car is, is, is one packet. And we have, you know, empty cars in that packet so we can put the Wi-Fi data into that stream. So it's a fully integrated system within what we're doing. You can use it for external device. You can use it for access points. And the access points that we like are the ones that have either multiple beam antennas with multiple radios, or the other way is to have uh, single chips that can do multiple radios on one chip. And both those approaches make sense. They basically give you a Wi-Fi that gives you a similar footprint to your commercial system without having to add extra cable using the same fiber so you're maximizing your speed. So that's what differentiates Dali. Thank you, Gary. Uh, next question is related to antenna. Does the Dali system being digital require a dedicated antenna in the ceiling for each band, such as uh, in the case of a small cell? Does the system configuration use as CAT 6 or 7? Um, L2, the antenna in the ceiling in the in building system, or, and um, same question as well, would you call the DALI system a small cell configuration? Okay, a lot of, lot of questions there. Yes. Um, <laughs> first of all, um, the key to everything is analog is, or, or RF is analog, wireless is analog, and, and it doesn't matter whether we've got you know, digital modulation schemes or 256 QAM or whatever, you've got an analog signal coming out of the antenna. 
the DALI low power system uses a single integrated antenna for four bands. Okay? The DALI higher power systems typically have separate antenna outputs and you can combine those into a single antenna. And there's a lot of very broadband antennas out there right now. Um, you can basically cover from about 400 up to 2.5, 400 megahertz, 2.5 gigahertz on a single antenna. So you can combine it, and in a lot of cases, aesthetics will determine that you've only got a single antenna. The antennas are all fed by a coax. Um, you cannot feed an actual antenna via copper, whether it's Cat5, Cat6, or Cat7, but we can feed our remotes via Cat5, Cat6, or Cat7. The distance is very limited. In our case, we use standard small form factor pluggable transceivers, and those are available for single mode, multi mode, or copper connections. So we can use all of that to connect the remotes. But the device that has the RF amplifier in it, if you're getting any sort of power out of it, uh, can't be connected by a copper. You, you, you need to limit the power you have on the CAT5 to, to levels that are probably going to prevent you from having any sort of reasonable power at the remote. Okay, thank you, Gary. Um, next question, it's uh, back to the SIPRI connection. Um, there were situations where ALU opened up their protocol over SIPRI, uh, but Ericsson and Nokia haven't done that yet. How do you anticipate DALI uh, participating? It, it, uh, ALU never, ever, ever opened up their protocol. Okay? Um, ALU, under pressure from one of their primary customers, worked with TE to develop a proprietary interface which in that proprietary interface, the box is actually sold by ALU. What we did is said, the operators are all going to be reluctant, including Ericsson and Nokia, to open up their protocol to reveal the secret sauce, the O&M functions that they have embedded in their SIPRI stream. So as a consequence, that's why we went to the API I talked before, I talked about before, an application program interface defines for the operators the input that they need to give us. And if you want to know how this works in real life, right now most of the big OEMs are buying their radios from a third party source. Uh, they're marking them up. If you talk to them realistically, most of them aren't making a lot of money on them. They become a, a double markup for the operators the margin on them is not very high, and by using an API, we give them the chance to develop a piece of software which they can sell to the operators on a per installation basis at significantly lower cost than their normal remote and still maintain their bottom line margins without giving away any proprietary any proprietary information. So this is what we've done instead. We think that uh, an open standard for SIPRI would be absolutely wonderful, but we've tried to have an open standard going back to GSM, going back to UMTS, going to LTE, going to SIPRI, going to OBSI, and it hasn't worked yet because every operator or every manufacturer tries to protect their own product, and rightly so. That's how they make money. So the answer to the question is we believe that an open API is a much better solution for all parties concerned. Thank you, Gary. Um, last uh, two questions uh, before we close off. Uh, the second last is can you remotely adjust the uplink and downlink signals in the RF conditioning modules? Yes, you can. In fact, our standard RF conditioning modules plugged into the chassis have uplink and downlink uh, control, remote control. Um, we can adjust those individually. We also have complete monitoring, uh, non-intrusive monitoring of both the SIPRI data stream 
and the analog RF stream, plus the fact because we're sending all of this data digitally, we can go right through that interface out to the remote and provide full and complete control of that remote up to and including uh, loopback signals for ease of optimization and spectrum analysis so you can actually look for interferers in a live network remotely. Okay, uh, last question. How does DALI's solution differ in an enterprise uh, environment versus, let's say, a traditional RF-based DAS system? Can you please elaborate the advantages and disadvantages? Yeah, first of all, again, we're talking about an evolution here. DALI can install a system that looks exactly like a traditional DAS. The difference would be that all of the transport of RF signals would be done as digital packet data. What differentiates us from the standard analog DAS is that there's no losses in the fiber. The signal from one end to the other com maintains complete integrity. There is no added noise from the fiber path. Because we use SFPs, which only work in a digital environment, you can actually source the FF SFPs by power or distance, which means you can pick the lowest cost SFP that does the job for you. And the key to all of this, that's today. We have a better traditional DAS, but more importantly, all of the modules that I plugged into that can be used in the future. So as we migrate to 5G and virtual RAN in the 2020-2025 time frame, everything I put in that network is still usable. Even though you're going to be taking out the individual conditioning modules, you can replace those with a digital module. Thank you, Gary. Um, so that concludes all of our q and I know we have uh, uh, quite a few more that we have not answered, so we'll um, take those offline. Uh, I just want to take the chance to uh, thank you, Soyola, for organizing this uh, webinar. And thank you, Lance and Gary, for a very informative um, webinar with very detailed questions um, and answers. Um, I just wanted to mention that the webinar will be um, is recorded. So we'll send that link um, over in the next couple of days. And if you have any other further questions, uh, please do um, reach out to us and then we'll answer them separately as well. Thank you everyone for joining us.